This was the title of our lesson, Creation, Genesis's Foundation, Part 1. And so uh, I just want to point out that uh, Genesis is really the foundation for all of the doctrines that follow in the rest of scripture that uh, I, I've, uh, maybe I did this when you were here uh, in the seminary, uh, Jan, um, and, that, and, and that we went through Genesis and saw that it has at least the embryo of all the major doctrines of the Bible. So you can take the 28 fundamental beliefs and you can go back and you can either find the, the full the full force, like in creation and in marriage and in the Sabbath, or you can find at least the hint, at least the embryo of all the major doctrines. And, and that's the book of Genesis, but they're almost all in Genesis 1 to 3. And many have recognized that Genesis 1 to 3 is really the foundation of all the rest of Scripture. And so um, here's one quotation uh, from this uh, scholar in his book, Finding God at Harvard. Whether one is evangelical or liberal, it is clear that Genesis 1 to 3 is the interpretive foundation of all scripture. And I know when I was writing my book on sexuality, I, I found out that, that the, the basic features of what God has to say about uh, sexuality and marriage, they're all there in Genesis 1 to 3. And then they're elaborated on later on in scripture, but this is the foundation. In fact, if we had time, we would go through uh, Genesis 1 to 3 as basically presenting the, uh, the major seven uh, central theological themes of Scripture. Now, I'm, I'm just curious. Can you see the top line of that? It's, it's blocked from my, my screen, but can you see, does it say Genesis? The, can you see the whole top line of that or just the bottom, second line? It says Genesis 1 through 3, seven central theological themes of Scripture. Okay, you can read all of that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's, it's blocked on my computer, but I, I, I trust that you are seeing it. So, okay, good. So, I, I've actually uh, written this up in another article, looking at these seven themes in this article, uh, back to beginning, Genesis 1 to 3 in the Theological Center of Scripture. And you can uh, find this if you want to read this whole thing. You can see at the bottom there my website, uh, andrews.academia.edu, Richard Davidson. And you can look up this article and, and uh, find more detail of how all the major themes uh, of the Bible, they, they just leap out from the opening pages of Genesis 1 to 3. And they actually form what I like to call the, the grand meta narrative, the grand story of scripture. It's, it's all starts right there in Genesis one to three. And the foundation of course is creation. That's what we're gonna be spending our time on here. But when you look at the two chapters, Genesis one and Genesis two, you find that Genesis one uses the name Elohim for God, which is his, uh, the name meaning almighty, powerful, transcendent. And when you get to Genesis two, uh, it, it it adds another name, Yahweh, which is his personal name. And so not only is this story in Genesis 1 and 2 telling us about creation, but more precisely about the creator who was all powerful. He can do anything, but he is Yahweh. He is the, the personal God who comes down to be close to us. And so here is his all power and all, all love together. The character of God is revealed in creation. And in Genesis 3 then, we find the, the rise of this moral conflict over God's character, the great controversy on earth. It starts there. And you recall the story of how uh, Satan, uh, using the serpent, uh, lisps lies about God through the serpent. And Eve believes those lies, and Adam believes those lies. And, and so they take the fruit, and the, the, the uh, floodgates of, war, of, of woe are opened upon the world. But God has the gospel ready for them, even in the midst of that first investigative judgment in, in Genesis 3. Uh, he gives the first gospel promise through the messianic seed. And there in that first promise, which is really, Ellen White describes this as the first statement of the everlasting covenant that, mm -hmm. that the Father and the Son made together as they clasped hands, even before creation, saying if, if Adam and Eve should sin, that uh, 
Jesus would come to die for us. And there you have the picture of Jesus stepping on this poisonous snake and receiving the venom from Satan. And he takes the venom that we deserved so that we can have uh, his, his righteousness that, uh, that he worked out for us here. And so the substitutionary atonement's right there at the heart of the, of the message of these opening chapters. And, but uh, the good news, the even uh, the better, uh, not better, but additional good news is that the serpent's head is going to be crushed. Yeah. And this cosmic conflict is one day going to be over. And we can have a new creation. And that's uh, so we go from creation in Genesis 1 and 2 to the end of evil and looking forward to the new creation. And the setting for all of that is the sanctuary. The great controversy started up in the heavenly sanctuary. And then down on earth, God, plant, God plants a garden in Eden. There was a heavenly uh, garden of God called Eden in Ezekiel 28, and then God plants a copy of that on earth. And there, there was the original sanctuary. Uh, and Adam and Eve were, were the officiants there in the original sanctuary. And then we have this first, after they sin, we have this first uh, um, investigative judgment in which Adam and Eve are, are asked, uh, asked to testify. And in the process of testifying, they perjure themselves and show that their hearts have been curved toward evil. And God has to give the verdict of guilty and the, the sentence of death. But then he says, but my son will come and die the second death that you all deserve. And so that's the setting in which we're going to be looking today at creation. I, we, just, we need to see how creation is part of this big picture, this meta-narrative. That's uh, the, the, the major central theological themes of scripture. They all, they all start with creation. And so... Let's go and let's look at this, uh, the, the basic elements in the creation account. And um, I'm going to suggest that this first verse highlights the basic elements that we need to study, that we need to be solid on if we're going to have a solid biblical view of creation. It starts out in the beginning. And that's the when of creation. And that is attack everywhere with evolution as a, as a counterfeit. And then the who of creation, the God of creation, that is also attacked as Satan is, is seeking to malign the character of God. And then the how of creation, God created not by time, not by time and chance, not by evolutionary processes, but by divine fiat. God speaks and it happens. And then the what of creation, the heavens and the earth. So we're going to look at all, all four of these. We may not get to all of them today, but thankfully I've got two weeks. We've got two weeks together. So we'll, we'll look at probably the first two today. And then we'll look at the last two uh, next week. And we'll, we'll then uh, look at how principles of hermeneutics, the principles of interpretation, we'll review those principles we've learned this, this quarter and show how applying those principles saves us from going either into one ditch or the other ditch of error with regard to creation. So we're going to start with the when. And could I have a volunteer to read for us Genesis 1, verses 1 to 5. Genesis 1, 1 to 5. I'll do it. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and he called, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning one day. Beautiful. Thank you, Bob, for sharing that. Um, so we're going to look at several questions regarding the when, and they all deal with these first five verses of Genesis. And the first question is that uh, is uh, debated among uh, scholars and also ha has a lot of different uh, uh, questions among various, uh, various groups. Is, is this creation an absolute creation? 
an absolute beginning, I should say, or only a relative beginning. Now you see that when, if you look at a variety of translations, uh, you find two basic translations of this first verse of Genesis. You find the, the King James, the New King James, the New Living Translation, the NIV, the New American Standard Bible, and uh, so forth, translating it the tr traditional way with an independent clause. I'm asking you to review your grammar here from grammar school. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We heard Bob read that, and uh, many of the translations have that. But there are some Jewish translations, some Catholic translations, and some Protestant translations that have that have changed that. And they read using the dependent clause here. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, dot, 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 the earth was without form and void and so forth. And, and it, it, it reads very differently. Well, you say, well, what difference does that make? Well, it makes a lot of difference. Let's look at, let's look at the implications. If you take the independent clause, you've got clearly implied creation out of nothing, creatio ex nihilo, because God exists before matter, and everything is created by him. In the beginning, God, not matter. And then comes matter and all the rest of the, uh, yeah. the forming of matter that God does. So there's an absolute beginning of time for the cosmos in God. But if you go to, if you read the way some of the modern versions are reading, here's what it, here's what it does. There's no creation out of no, nothing mentioned. Because when God began to create, matter is already in existence, according to this translation. And so there's no absolute beginning indicated. And a lot of people like that translation because then it leaves room for evolution. Because uh, matter is already there when God is starting to create and it could be just evolving along the way. Uh, uh, is it really this important? Well, look at this. Uh, yes. Victor says this in his commentary. The issue between these two options is not esoteric quibbling. Does Genesis 1-1 suggest that in the beginning there was one God? Or does it suggest that in the beginning there were two God and pre-existent chaos? It makes a world of a difference, indeed. When you go back through the history of how uh, this first verse of the Bible has been translated, the traditional translation has been the standard one throughout history until the 19th century. And, and uh, scholars have recognized that this implies an absolute beginning and a divine creation out of nothing. This translation, this new one of dependent clause, it's relatively new, and it's come about primarily when scholars, archaeologists, found these ancient Near Eastern creation texts, such as the Enuma Elish, these Mesopotamian creation stories. And they all start with a dependent clause, like uh, Enuma Elish, which actually is the very first words of this story from from Mesopotamia that goes way back to the to the th uh, third millennium uh, and it starts out when on high the gods and then it goes on to describe uh, matter which is already present when the gods uh, at, at, at the same time as the gods um, so how do we decide these scholars that are arguing for this dependent clause, they say, well, that's what the Bible says. I mean, uh, that's, that's the best way to read the text, is it? I'd like to suggest there's powerful evidence for taking the traditional view. Here's some of the evidence. It's true that verse 1 does not have an article. In It literally reads, in beginning. And so that's what makes some of these scholars say, well, the grammar is saying, in beginning... And so that maybe should be when God began instead of the way we usually say it. But no, you look at Isaiah 46, for example, when you have a phrase, a prepositional phrase that uses a preposition of time, like this one, bereshit, reshit, in beginning. 
Isaiah 46 uses the exact same form from the beginning, from the God knows the end from the beginning. There's no article there, but everyone agrees you got to supply the article. So this is just um, a, a quirk of Hebrew grammar that for these temporal clauses, you do not need the article. So the natural way to read Hebrew grammar would not be in beginning or when God began, but in the beginning. First of, and next, if you have when God began, then, you, then you're starting out with the dependent clause. And then what's, what's it like when God began? Well, the earth is without form, and darkness is upon the face of the deep, and the spirit was hovering over the waters. And God said, you get all the way through chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, one big, long, clumsy sentence. And that doesn't match the rest of the chapter. The rest of the, rest of the chapter, chapter 1, has these short, crisp, uh, terse, uh, sentences that uh, would be totally messed up by translating it that other way. And the theological thrust, the transcendence of God, the whole chapter is when God says things happen, not something already there when God, before God starts speaking, that would be out of, con, out of, uh, out of character with the, pres the picture of God that's presented. And all of the ancient versions use the independent clause, the, the Greek translation, the Latin Vulgate, the, the Aquila and Theodosian and Syriac, and the, the Jewish Targumim, and we could go on and on. They all, without any exception, recognize that this is in the beginning, not when God began having the matter already there. And then what clenches it to me is John 1.1. 1, 1. So could someone read for us John 1, 1 to 3? John 1, verses 1 to 3. I'll read it. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Beautiful. You notice it starts out in the beginning, the very same way that Genesis 1-1 starts out. But if you read that in Greek, both in the Old Testament or in John, it doesn't have the article. It reads N-R-K, N, in beginning, no article. And yet, there's no translation that leaves out the the, because that, again, is just the uh, idiomatic way that uh, this phrase is used. And so John 1.1 1, 1 makes it clear because in John 1.1, 1, 1, you can't translate it as a dependent clause. It has to be translated. In the beginning was the word. So with all of this evidence, I cannot, uh, I cannot find any reason to, to go, go to this new view and instead, the evidence points decisively toward this traditional translation of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the implication is, if God's in the beginning and then the, the heavens and the earth come after that, God is creating out of nothing. And there's a whole book, beautiful book, by uh, Paul Copen and William Lane Craig, uh, describing creation out of nothing that builds on these, uh, this argument here. But I love the way Ellen White says it in Education, page 134. In the beginning, God. Here alone can the mind in its eager questioning, fleeing as a dove to the ark, find rest. Isn't that a beautiful statement? You know, we have the evolutionists who go back and they say, well, uh, it all started with the Big Bang. And then you ask them, well, where, what was before the Big Bang? And their mouths drop open and they say, uh, we don't know. It's a mystery how all of this came out of nothing. They also require faith. And the Bible position also requires faith. Hebrews 11.3, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Creation out of nothing. 
But I don't know about you, but I'd rather have faith in the God of the beginning than faith in the Big Bang, bang and matter mysteriously arising out of nothing. Uh, I think uh, our faith in God, the God of the beginning, is a more reasonable position even than the evolutionists, even though they claim that uh, the religious view is, is, is uh, short on reason. I just disagree. Anyway, so I think we have good evidence for this solid, absolute beginning in God. All right, let's look at the next issue. Is there a literal beginning or a non-literal beginning? So, uh, pa uh, Pastor Phil, you were mentioning before we went online, what difference does it make if we have a literal beginning or a not? Are you still, are you on there, Phil? I'm here. I'm here. Okay, so what were you saying? You were telling us about why, why you think this is so significant about creation. Well, there are profound, deeply profound implications um, because, uh, you know, I've always seen uh, the Bible as, um, uh, to, to use the uh, scholarly constructs that, that someone in your field teaches, as being a chiastic structure. And what you see happening in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis um, you see the, the, uh, the counterpart to that in the last three chapters of the book of Revelation. And yes. I think simply put, if I don't believe in Genesis 1 through 3, how can I possibly believe in Revelation chapter 20, 21, and 22? That's right. That's beautiful. Uh, I think uh, the scholars would say it this way, protology matches eschatology, right? <laughs> what you have in the beginning, if that's literal, then you have a literal end. But if you don't have a literal beginning, don't try to tell me Jesus is going to literally come again in the clouds. Come on. It's going to, if it's, if, if protology is just some sort of symbol, then so is his coming going to be some sort of symbol. So there is a lot at stake, not just creation, but the, in fact, uh, without a literal beginning, there's no literal end. And if you stop and think of it, the doctrines of humanity, sin, salvation, judgment, Sabbath, presented already in the opening chapters, all hinge upon a literal interpretation of origins. If, if we are just a product of time and chance, of tooth and claw, then, a, then humans are really not responsible for what they've done. There really is no such a thing as sin. Uh, it's, we're just uh, evolving. And so there's, if there's no sin, then there's no guilt, and then there's no need of salvation, then there's no need of judgment. And uh, Sabbath, if it's just uh, uh, symbolic, then what, there's no real literal Sabbath day. So why should there be a literal uh, seventh day Sabbath day that we keep today? And it, it's like a, a, a house of cards. They all come falling down if you don't have a literal interpretation of origins. But unfortunately, most of the Christian world has turned away from a literal six-day creation. I hate to say that, but even among evangelicals, it's only a minority who believe in a literal, recent six-day creation. And uh, so we need to understand that as we're talking to people. We understand that most likely if you talk to someone, a secular person, or even a, a, a good conservative Christian, most likely Chances are they won't be believing like we do in a literal six-day creation. Here's, uh, now, I mean, the good news is this was the traditional view of Christians and Jews down through history uh, in the, of a literal interpretation of creation uh, as a chronological succession of six literal 24 hours day followed by the literal 24-hour Sabbath. And there's this cool book by Andrew Brown, The Days of Creation, who traces this this literal belief all the way through scripture. But then he points out that just about the same time as the, uh, uh, the state of the dead was changed, and these other errors came into our church in the first, in the early centuries of the Christian church, that uh, the allegorical view of Plato, which brought about uh, the view that we have an so internal soul, and therefore uh, we never die, it also implies that God is a timeless and spaceless. Plato believed that God lived up in a place 
not a place. It's just a, a realm of ideas that we don't have a real heaven. We don't have a real God who has a form, who, who, who can come into space and time. And the Christian scholars of those days, uh, uh, Philo the Jew, and then Origen of Alexandria, and then those who followed him, and then Augustine and others, they, they all took on this view, this Greek view of reality. And, and thus they imposed this, imposed this upon Scripture. And so if God can't truly come down into space and time, then they have to take creation allegorically. And Augustine, Origen, takes it as an allegory with God creating six instantaneous days in his mind. And thus we cannot accept it as literal history. So unfortunately, this uh, false understanding of creation was introduced really early. Well, here's some of the non-literal views we have to contend with today. There's, they're everywhere. Some say it's mythological. It's just a, a remnant of the uh, ancient Near Eastern myths of creation. Some say that it was a, a cosmic temple inauguration. Uh, John Walton's new book comes out and says, well, God was inaugurating the temple, the temple of the Sabbath and uh, the temple here of creation. And the inauguration took seven days, but he'd already created through evolution millions of years be, uh, before. Some say, well, it's just a literary framework. It's not a chronology of duration. No, it just gives you a, a literary a structure for the text. Others say, oh, it's theology. It's just giving this, telling us that God did it. It doesn't say how he did it. It doesn't say whether he did it through uh, six-day creation or whether it was evolution. So we have to strip away the theology from the, uh, from the history and not accept it as historical. Others say it's just, it's, it's giving us a basis of worship. So here's the rhythm of a weekly worship. Others say this is symbolism. A day represents uh, a long period of time, long ages, the day age theory. Another theory is that it's cosmic time. It's six days in a different warp of time that only physics can, physicists can begin to understand. So it's six days of God's kind of days. God's work days, not like ours. So he's using analogical or anthropomorphic language to talk about it, but it's not six literal days here on this earth. Or it's poetry, or it's metaphor, or it's parable, or it's vision. All these different non-literal theories have one thing in common. They all deny that Genesis' account is a literal, straightforward, historical account of a material creation. So you're going to meet people. Unfortunately, you're going to meet some within the church that believe this. And I, I want us to have good answers. And I, I want to share with you that there are good answers for supporting the literal understanding. And here's some of the evidence that I have found persuasive from Scripture. Number one, you look at uh, genre. This is a fancy word for the literary type. Is this history? Is this poetry? Is this, is this narrative? Uh, is this law? Is this uh, uh, some other kind of some other kind of uh, literary form? And those who specialized in discourse analysis, at looking at the text of Scripture and saying, what kind of language is being used here? They all agree that the, the literary type of this section, Genesis 1 to 11, is simple historical narrative prose, that it is intending to give you a narrative of what literally happened. Along the same lines, you look at the book of Genesis, and I always like to ask of every book, uh, what is the big picture of this of Genesis? And you look for recurring themes or recurring words that recur throughout the book. And in the case of Genesis, you have this book, you have this word toledot, which is usually translated generations or sometimes history. Thirteen times it appears throughout the book. It appears, first of all, in Genesis 2, verse 4, where we read uh, Genesis 2, 4. This is the history of of the heavens and the earth when they were created. It actually uses this term, which means history, something that really happened. 
Sometimes it's translated genealogies or generate generations because God generated something on each one of the days. And it's, it's used to introduce the story of the flood. It's used to introduce the story of Abraham and the story of Jacob and the story of Isaac and the story of Joseph. Each one used before each one of these uh, narratives are used, either before or after, it, God uses the word, Moses writes down this word, toledot. This is the history of Abraham. This is the history of Jacob. This is the history of Joseph and his descendants. This is the history of the flood. And this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And I find it ironic that evangelical scholars, conservative evangelical scholars, they're willing to see the rest of Genesis, the story of Abraham, the story of Isaac, the story of Jacob, the story of Joseph and, and the sons of Jacob as, as literal history. But the first 11 chapters, for some reason, they arbitrarily say, well, no, this isn't history. This is a different kind. This is, this is uh, something non-literal. Well, if you want to know what the author of this book, God, ultimate author, and Moses, the inspired writer, what he thought, Moses gave a title for each section, and he said, this is history. If you want to argue with God, if you want to argue with Moses, be my guest. But if you want to take what Scripture says, the script, the Scripture is insisting that this is a literal account of what really happened. Then we have these specific terms. And before I show that slide, help me think about what things are there in uh, Genesis 1 and 2. What language that gives you the idea that it's literal? Help me. Think about it. Give me some suggestions of what you, what you remember in Genesis 1 and 2. Do you have any temporal terms there? He created um, man in his in their image, you know, in our image. Let us create man in our image. I mean, that sounds literal to me. Okay, some very literal descriptions of what God is doing, literally. That's right, good. Does he use any words connected with time in Genesis 1? Well, what I see constantly, it says, God bless, God created. God said, God made, God said, God blessed. That's a repetitious phrase throughout the whole. It is. Genesis. That's right. And it's all, it's, it sounds like historical narrative, doesn't it? It's like saying exactly what God is doing. Good, good. So how long did it take according to the text? Immediate. Okay. How about the entire, the entire thing? Is it about millions of years? No. Where, one, week, where, one week, one day, every every day, you know, oh, evening, morning, day one. Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, let's let's look at that. The, these terms, evening and morning. This phrase is used fifty-seven times in the Bible outside here, outside of Genesis one, and every time it refers to a solar day. One solar day, not symbolic for some long ages. And the word day. Now, I noticed in the quarterly, I think it, it didn't give the full picture because the word day, even in Genesis 1 and 2, sometimes can be used figuratively, and we have to acknowledge that. In Genesis 2, verse 4, it says, this is the history in the heavens of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. In the day that does that mean one 24-hour day? No. I, I say this all the time. I say in this day and age in which we live, I don't mean a single day. I'm talking about this time. It, uh, so day can sometimes be used figur figuratively on that day or uh, in this day and age. But how do you know then whether it's going to be used figuratively or, or uh, literally? Well, whenever the term day, yom, in Hebrew, is used with a number, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, it's used 
in a literal way. You can go to the 359 times where you have yom used with a number. It's always a literal day. Now, you may say, well, what about prophecy? Oh, no, even in prophecy, he's talking about a literal day, but he's saying this literal day, I'm going to say now, symbolizes a year. So it's not a symbolic day. It's a literal day. 24-hour day is going to symbolize a year. So even there, you have to say literal day, but used uh, to refer to a prophetic time. So you've got the term evening morning, you got the term day, and then you have the sun and the moon, the greater light and the lesser light that are specifically stated that they are to be dividing the day from the night to rule over the day and the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So how can it be then something symbolic when it actually has the times and years that this this day and night cycle are going to be uh, uh, dividing up. And then again, you have to look at everything scripture says. And when you go to Genesis 1 to 11, and then you go to the New Testament, Jesus and all the New Testament writers, and I'm referring to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Jude, and then Jesus himself, and Peter, they all allude to or actually quote from Genesis 1 to 11 and assume literal, reliable history by the way they quote it. And I think in next week's list lesson, you're going to have a whole page where you look at all those different quotes from the New Testament writers, and you see that for them, Genesis 1 to 11, including the creation account, is literal, reliable history. So, uh, as my professor, when I studied here at the seminary, he was my major professor, Gerhard Hazel, and, and his last article he wrote before he died, in fact, it was published after his death, was called The Days of Creation in Genesis 1. And it's a moving story for me because uh, he had died and he had made a major mark on scholarship outside the Adventist church. And so they had a special session at the Evangelical Theological Society honoring him. And his son, Michael Hazel, who is one of the authors of our quarterly, wrote, uh, read, his, read his paper on the days of creation there. And there were many, many scholars in the room that did not believe in six days creation. And as he read the, art, the evidence from his dad's last article, before he died, you could feel a hush in the room. And after that article, I had one of those good friends of Hazel that uh, also knew me, non-Adventist scholar, very prominent non-Adventist scholar. And he came up to me and he said, I am thankful there are people like Hazel and like the Seventh-day Adventist church that still dares to speak of a six day literal creation. Don't let it go because the rest of evangelicalism has lost the vision of what you guys have. It was a powerful moment for me and he had tears in his eyes as he was speaking. So even John Walton, who believes in theistic evolution, he has to acknowledge the days of Genesis 1 are seven 24-hour days. This has always been the best reading of the Hebrew text. And you go to liberal scholars. You know, liberal scholars, they don't care what the text says. Uh, they, they don't care what Moses, they, of course, they don't believe Moses wrote this, but what the one who wrote this is actually intending, uh, they, they accept uh, the naturalistic worldview of Dar Darwinian evolution, and uh, they just say, well, the Bible's wrong here. But when you ask them, well, what do you think the author intended here when he wrote? They generally acknowledge, look, how can you, how can you, ignore, how can you ignore it? He's, he's intending to teach a literal creation week. So here's an example, James Barr, Oxford University, uh, Riga scholar of Old Testament. Uh, he was uh, probably the most, one of the most prestigious, critical liberal scholars of the 20th century. Here's what he writes. 
so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 to 11 intended to convey to their readers the idea that one, creation took place in a series of six days, which are the same as the days of the 24 hours we now experience. He goes on to say, and we also believe in a, uh, they also intended to show a, a short time since creation of a few thousand years and a literal worldwide flood. He says, all the critical scholars see that. Ironically, it's the evangelical scholars who claim to believe in the authority of scripture, even claim to believe in a in a, uh, 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 an inerrant scripture, but they've also, for some crazy reason, they've adopted this current scientific census, consensus on origins. And they say, well, we got, I mean, science, how can you argue against science? It's, 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 it's so logical. And, and they've shown it, uh, they've proved that evolution exists. And so they're trying desperately to find ways around the biblical view. But so it's 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 often not the text that causes people to think that the account isn't literal, but only the demands of trying to harmonize with modern science, tragically. So my conclusion, based upon the testimony of the Genesis account and later intertextual allusions, I must join the host of scholars, ancient and modern, both critical and evangelical, who affirm the literal historical nature of Genesis 1 and 2 with a literal creation week consisting of six historical, contiguous, creative, natural 24-hour days, followed immediately by a literal 24-hour seventh day, during which God rested, blessing and sanctifying the Sabbath as a memorial of creation. And I'm happy to say that in our last general conference session, uh, this uh, this creation statement was was sharpened so that it it now says without any any ambiguity, a literal creation week. I'm, I'm praising God that that got passed at the last session. Uh, well, there's one more point I want to uh, get to, and that is one stage or two stage beginning. And here there's, there, there is a difference of view among Adventists, and I must, I must admit that. The text uh, allows for a couple of options. It does not allow for long ages but it allows for a couple of options and let me present different views that are, are on this, on this uh, subject. Single stage. So uh, here's what some Adventists believe, that, uh, that Genesis 1 is speaking only about this earth. And so the heavens and the earth refer to this earth and its immediate surrounding heaven, uh, atmospheric heavens, or perhaps the solar system, which are created during the creation week. And nothing is said about the creation of the universe in Genesis 1 and 2. This is held by, by some Adventists. Uh, there's another single stage view uh, uh, that is held by many evangelicals that still believe in a, in a, in a literal recent creation, especially the uh, Institute for Creation Research, ICR. And they, but they believe that the entire universe was created about 6,000 years ago. And so heavens and earth refers to the whole universe. And it was created 6,000 some 6, years ago. And so verses 1 and 2 are part of the six-day creation. And this is called young earth scientific creationism. The problem with this is for Adventists, we believe in a great controversy. We believe the angels and the unfollowed worlds were in existence before God creates this earth. Job 38, 6 talks about God laying the foundation of this earth. And at that time, it says, the sons of God shouted for joy. And the, the, uh, st the um, how does it read there, Joanne? The sons of God shouted for joy and all the, all the um, let's look at it. That, that's an important one to stop on. Job 38. Yeah. It's, uh, my wife likes to say this when she's sharing on Job that this these last four chapters are the longest the longest uh, speech of God in the Bible, and when God uses His longest speech, He preaches He speaks about creation, and He says to, about the earth, starting with verse four. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched out the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? He's uh, he's paying 
do you know? Or who laid its cornerstone? Then he goes, when the morning stars, there it is, sang together. The various unfallen universes, these morning stars sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. They were all already in existence when God uh, began creation week. And so we can't go with uh, young earth scientific creationism and still have room for the great controversy. They, they somehow try to fit it in by saying that, well, Satan and the angels were created on day one or day two. And then, uh, then Satan fell on maybe day three or four. And then uh, Satan uh, uh, came, uh, you know, uh, try, they try to fit it into one week. It just doesn't fit the picture of the great controversy as, uh, as the Bible describes it. Uh, then there's this active gap view, and this has been popular recently, until recently, and this is also called the ruin restoration theory. Uh, Jack Provencia was a proponent of this. Some of you have remembered Jack Provencia. That in verse 1, it describes God who created a perfect universe some unknown time ago. And then in verse 2, he, they translate, and the earth became without form and void. And that he, uh, Provencia and others have suggested, well, Satan was cast to this earth and he ruled a perfect creation before his rebellion. And then he rebelled and he spoiled this earth. And so the earth became chaotic because of Satan's experimentation or God's maybe judgment upon him. So there's this gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and then uh, Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. And then God creates this earth again. Uh, the theory, unfortunately, flounders when you look at the grammar of the Hebrew. Because the Hebrew cannot be translated, the earth became without form or void. It is a nominal clause expressing state, not process. Three states. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the, over the, wa over the waters. So the grammar doesn't support this interpretation. Uh, then uh, there's another one that suggested that uh, God just created functions on this, just gave functions, like the sun and the moon were already here, but he assigned them their functions, and he didn't actually create anything of material during the week. Uh, and that happened by an evolutionary process thousands or millions of years before that, and God is now just... Uh, doing this functional creation uh, inauguration service on the Sabbath of this day. Unfortunately, that one also found flounders because Genesis 1 and 2 describes a lot of things that God created. He creates the, the, uh, the firmament, the sky during this day, and he creates the animals during this day and he creates man during this day humanity humans mother um, male and female so god does creation during this day not just not just functional activity well there's one that's become more popular actually i i i believe that this one has a, a lot of evidence for it the two-stage creation and there's five main reasons why i believe this is that may be what what is described here in Genesis 1, 1 to 5, that uh, when you go to, to Genesis 1, every day starts with the phrase, and God said, and God said, and God said, and then it was day one, and God said, and then, and then he says it was good, and then day two, and then there was evening and morning. It has this, this formula, and God said, and there was evening and morning, day one, day two, day three. But you notice the and God said only starts in verse 3. Verses 1 and 2 are therefore, and if you look at this structure, they are before day 1. Uh, and this has been suggested by, by an, a, a number of, of uh, people. Uh, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, again, if you look at the syntax, the Hebrew, the way he, Hebrew sentences are put together. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 begins with a... a, per, a a past tense. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 2, you have these three verbs describing the state of the earth when it was made. It was without form, it was void, it was uh, darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit was hovering. 
And then finally in verse three, you have this regular form that introduces the narrative. And so, as John Collins says, throughout the Pentateuch, the normal use of the perfect at the very beginning of a, of a, a section is to denote an event that took place before the storyline gets underway. So Genesis 1-1 seems to be referring to that original creation when God created the universe and the angels and Satan. And then uh, perhaps this earth in its unformed, unfilled condition. And then in verse 3, uh, he, he comes down as a master artist and begins to form and to shape this world into its beautiful form during those six days. Another evidence for this, and I'm looking at the time, I think I have another seven minutes so we can get through this. Uh, there's, you've heard of the term dyad and triad. Dyad is a group of two. Triad is a group of three. And then there's one more term we've got to look at, and that's this word merism. Here we have merism, where you've got two extremes that are mentioned, summarizing the whole that's in between. And so this is a merism, heavens and earth. It's talking about the heavens, the farthest up you can think of, and the earth, the farthest down you can think of. And in its some 50 times it's used throughout the Bible, it's almost always used for the everything God made, the entire universe. The heavens and the earth is the whole, the whole ball of wax of what God created. And so if, if Genesis 1-1 is, is consistent with the rest of its usages in the rest of the Bible, then God is just telling us in verse 1, look, I created everything. I created everything that exists. I am before everything. Creation out of nothing. And then later in Genesis 1, you have God talking about heaven as a separate item, the sky, then earth, the dry land, and then the sea, which are earth's three habitats. And he gives them the name, earth, heaven, and sea. And this is not a dyad, this is a triad, three things, the three habitats, the sky where the birds are, the land where the land animals are, and the sea where the sea creatures are. And so if this is the case, then verse 1 is giving us the big picture. God created everything, including this earth. And what was this earth like when God first created it? It was unformed. It was unfilled. And it doesn't tell us how long this earth lay in its state. It's like uh, we, live, we have in our church uh, a, a wonderful artist, Nathan Green, and he uh, bent to his studio, and there he has all of his empty canvases there. And when he gets ready, he puts up the end of the canvas, and then he takes out his, out his paints and he paints the painting. Uh, God, if this is if this is the way that we would conceive Genesis one and two, God present God made the raw materials. He made the empty canvas and the paints, if you please. And then he came around perhaps to every world uh, in, this, in the universe. He came around and he became the master artist, taking up the paintbrushes and painting on this canvas, the unformed, unfilled, uh, raw materials. He paints into existence the various aspects of creation. You notice that Exodus 20, when it's talking about the Sabbath, it doesn't refer to the dyad, the heavens and the earth, but to the triad. In six days, God made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. So he's talking about these three habitats. Uh, this phrase, in the beginning, usually refers elsewhere in scripture to a period or duration of time, which falls before a series of events. And that would fit perfectly with here. There is a period of time which God is creating the rest of the universe and going from one world to another and finishing that stage. But then there comes a time when he now wants to let the whole universe see his artistry at work and the whole world, all the worlds, if you please, the sons of God are watching and cheering God on as he is forming and filling this, uh, this canvas of this earth in the six days of creation. And then, uh, the beginning then would describe that phase of the divine creation, which he creates the whole universe prior to creation week. 
Now, what to me is decided it for me, because I think it could go either way, but John 1.1 1, 1, to me is the, is the deciding verse, because John 1.1 1, 1 quotes Genesis 1.1 1, 1, in the beginning, and then applies it to the entire universe. John 1.1, 1, 1, as we read, in the beginning, God created, or in the beginning was the word, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's not just earth, this earth. That's everything. So John 1.1 1, 1 seems to take Genesis 1.1 1, 1 as describing the, uh, the whole universe. So here's a suggestion for the uh, two-stage creation summarized by John Collins. If Genesis 1.1 1, 1 tells us the origin of everything in the universe, and then in verse 1.1, 1, 1, it narrows its attention to the account of this earth, and then the very first verse narrates the initial creation event. Then verse 2 describes the condition of the earth just before creation gets weak, weak gets underway. These two verses stand outside the six days of God's workday week to say nothing about the length of time between the initial event and the first day of Genesis 1-3. So uh, this view of a two-stage creation goes way back, in, uh, back in the early times, so the earliest period of the uh, early Christian church and, uh, and history. So... I find this view to have uh, strong biblical evidence, but I don't to totally rule out view number one, uh, that, that it's a one-stage creation for this earth. I think both are, both are uh, possible from the text. Either the raw materials were created as part of day one, or the raw materials were created as part of that first wave of creation when God creates the whole universe. But I'm sure of one thing from the text, life on earth is recent. Life on earth was not created before creation week, but was created during the six-way creation week. So there's some things we can be very sure about in this creation account. We can be sure about a six literal day creation. We can be sure about, and we're going to get to this next week, that it was recent, a recent creation, a recent beginning. And we can be sure that God created out of nothing. But was there, were there two stages or one stage for this earth? The Bible's not absolutely clear, and we can't uh, tell someone who may believe differently than we are on some of those unsure, uh, uncertain matters. Uh, you've got to believe this way or this way. We have to leave some things open that God hasn't clearly revealed to us. So that's where we get so far. We've looked at the when. Next week, we'll look at the who and the how and the what, and we'll give a, a, one more look, a little look at the recent or remote beginning. So thank you for letting me share. I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, we can look at each other. And we have maybe just a couple minutes uh, for some comments, and I'm going to leave lots of time, Phil, next week, okay? So right. we're not going to take the whole time next week. Uh, we'll leave like uh, 20 minutes or so just to discuss all of this. So I wanted right. to get this evidence out there, and we'll close it off with the rest of the evidence next week, and then we'll have a good discussion. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for setting the stage. So are there any questions that any of you might have right now for Dr. Davidson that uh, maybe he may not fully answer now, but maybe even next week? So uh, I see Lionel, go ahead. Well, I don't have a question. I do have a couple of things that I wanted to say it as you were talking. I, I venture weighing in on the evolution of, 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 of the earth, you know, thousand years, one day and two things. So I, I really, uh, I guess I really kind of thought about it for, for quite some time. Then all of a sudden it dawned on me. If you believe that the earth, this evolutionary process of the earth took thousands and thousands of years, it literally takes out the Sabbath. So we can no longer honor the Sabbath. So that means if we're going to honor the Sabbath, that means that we got to be celebrating it for a thousand years. That didn't make no sense at all. That's right. So, you, uh, so now I could see that, I, 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 God had to show me that. I could see the danger of, of believing on that. Yeah, and very good, thing, very good. And then the other thing, I'm not a scientist, and but there was a period of time that I was teaching just very elementary science. And it's all of a sudden, I came across this phrase that it says, matter cannot be created or destroyed. Hmm. It, it, it's a basis of science. It's a basis of, uh, 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 yeah, of, uh, of DNA and molecules and that, then I said, well, wait a minute, if science, if, if matter cannot be created or destroyed, so it makes no sense for evolutionists to believe that all of a sudden 
everything came from the big explosion. So if you believe in the big explosion, then you have to believe that God said, let there be light. Mm -hmm. Because there is the there is there there is the form of form, there is the form is being created out of formlessness. If formlessness yeah. is a word. So God can only create something out of nothing, which that's what a lot of major scientists believe. So therefore, I have a hard time understanding why they cannot see, besides that they're being blind by their arrogance and education, etc., and, and denying the existence of God. Mm -hmm. So so I say my Christians believe not only as a assembly of God believer and a, an Adventist believer has evolutionized just upon these two. To me, they're very simple, but yet deep concepts that it's out there argue in the world. Beautiful. I thank you brought up the Sabbath because to me, that is the biggest argument that the, the, when you get right down to it, evangelicals are trying to get rid of the Sabbath, the need to keep the seventh day Sabbath too often. And if you have a literal Sabbath and you then if you have a literal six day creation, then you got to have a literal Sabbath. And so they find some way to get around it, unfortunately. And I, I'm not, I mean, a lot of people are doing that ignorantly. They're, they're not realizing they're doing that. And I, I believe in the last days, God, God's going to open the minds of the honest in heart to actually see the link between the Sabbath and creation. Yeah. But more than just that, uh, Dr. Dick, uh, I'm thinking about the whole issue of sin and the need for salvation. I mean, uh, there are profound, profound implications uh, uh, that's why I think it's essential what you presented today, you know, that truly, truly, this is the foundation uh, for the rest of the scripture. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Alan Reinick. Thank you. And I'm very thankful for this presentation. Greetings to Dr. Davidson. Hi welcome. there, Alan. Good to see you. So, um, you know, I don't know that it's, well, well, it's ironic. So evangelicals are are undermining the biblical foundation of the Sabbath because of their beef with us over uh, the nature of law and our relationship to it. But it's the more progressive and Roman Catholic traditions that are uh, really insisting on Sabbath as important for uh, the saving of the planet for environmental reasons. Hmm. And I think that, you know, in the end, something is going to bring everyone around to the need for a common day of rest uh, because of environmental tragedies or, or, or something. But, you know, the, if you think about it, it's easy for us to have a belief in a universal Sunday law at the end of time. It's much harder to imagine how we get there and how yeah, we get yeah. the different cultures and religions of the world to actually agree on something, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. gotta be something dramatic. In the end, I think evangelicals are, are, are likely to come around uh, and follow the Roman Catholic view as they have so far on the issue of the, the unborn and the whole abortion issue. They've been, you know, taking a page from the Catholics and, and on so many other issues. Catholicism has been the intellectual foundation. Yeah, very good observations. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Well, listen, uh, we, we have come to the end of our time today, and we're going to have to make a hard break now. But uh, thank you again so much, uh, Dr. Davidson, for making this presentation. And for uh, I just can't even begin to express uh, the gratitude in our hearts that we feel here in uh, Simi Valley uh, for your willingness to share with us now the second time. You are actually the one to launch us into our, uh, into our time of, of, uh, of distancing. Uh, back in March, and here we have you now, and we'll have you again next Sabbath, and then look forward to uh, uh, Dr. Joanne uh, being with us on the first Sabbath in June, dealing with Bible uh, as history. So thank you again so much to the Davidson family and, and your daughter, Rahel, who uh, did an exceptional job. So uh, uh, the Davidson family is certainly making a mark in uh, uh, the Adventist society and certainly here in the Simi Valley Adventist Church. So again, thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. And I'm wondering if you would have, uh, uh, Dr. Dick, if you would have a benediction for us now. Sure. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of opening your word. And today we've had the chance to open the, op the opening pages of scripture and to see there that wonderful phrase, in the beginning, God. 
And thank you that in our eager questioning, we can flee as a dove to the ark, to that assurance that you, God, were before anything, that you have made everything, and that you are not only one, not only the creator of this universe, but you want to create in us a clean heart. Mm. And we invite you to do that again today. Thank you for hearing our prayer and give us a blessed Sabbath in Jesus' name. Amen.